This is the CR10S Pro, the successor to the hugely popular CR10. In this honest review, we'll find out whether it lives up to the hype. First, we had the Creality CR10, and then the CR10S, and now we have the CR10S Pro. Unlike the Ender 3 and Ender 3 Pro, which doesn't really have a great deal of difference in its features, this one has quite a few things that are a step up from the previous model. This one was supplied by Banggood for this review, and let's start by taking a closer look at the specifications. Prices, as always, fluctuate, but you can expect to pick up this for around $600 US dollars. Compare that to around US $400 for an original CR10 and around $500 US dollars for a CR10S. This new printer is also large format with 300 by 300 by 400 millimeters. It maintains the filament runout detection from the CR10S, but the big new feature is the ABL or automatic bed leveling. It uses a contactless probe to build up a 4x4 matrix. The new mainboard is worth mentioning as are the quiet TMC stepper motor drivers and Creality have made the surprising but welcome move to import Capricorn Teflon tube, something a lot of people previously upgraded to. Now I might add something subjective and it's how handsome this printer looks. Compared to the previous CR10s where their control boxes to the sides and wiring everywhere, this all-in-one design looks a lot more sophisticated. I particularly like the red anodized aluminium pieces all around the machine. Not to say it's perfect however, as you'll see in this review, it's often a case of several steps forward, but one step back. Let's start by looking at unboxing and assembly. Unboxing and assembly was a breeze. It only takes about 10 to 15 minutes because there's only about four bolts and a few cables to plug in before you're done. This printer came with the usual assortment of tools and spares, but a particular highlight was the instruction manual. Everything was well illustrated and very clear and easy to follow. After assembly, it even takes you on to bed leveling in two parts, as well as a section explaining software installation and how to achieve your first print with Cura. There's even a labeled diagram of the main board. When you first turn it on, you'll notice how large and vibrant that big touchscreen is. At 4.3 inches, it's definitely a cut above what you'll find on most other 3D printers. Only one problem for me, it was in Chinese. Fortunately, I found the option fairly quickly inside the menus. It was time to get to work, so I started exploring the menus and found that they were really well laid out with logical labels and easy to use controls. For things like heating, you have presets, but you can also bring up a keypad and dial in the exact value that you're after. My only annoyance was the beep sound like a dial up modem. That's better. I decided to home the printer and get on with leveling the bed. Unlike the CR10 and CR10S, there's no Z limit switch. Instead, we have an adjustable contactless sensor, similar to the Pinder probe in the Prusa Mark III, but without temperature compensation. You're firstly encouraged to do auxiliary leveling, which is manually doing it with a piece of paper, and there's buttons on the LCD to help move the nozzle around the various areas of the bed. After this, you can turn on auto leveling and measure a 4x4 grid. This is not the fastest process, but I don't think it's intended to be done before each individual print. There's also an additional process using shims supplied in the kit to get everything aligned to the correct height, set up the Z offset and calibrate the probe correctly. More on this later in the video. So with that easy assembly and great instruction manual, we were off to a pretty good start and things continue to improve from there with the first test print on the SD card. Although I should note it wasn't placed in the root directory of the SD card and it wouldn't appear until I moved it there on my computer. Printed on the pearl white PLA that came with the machine, this thing has a really, really nice surface finish. You can still see the layer lines, but the extrusion is very consistent. The only imperfections is where each new layer starts and you can see some of the infill inside because this plastic is a little bit translucent. It was time to start my own test prints and the profile that I used was the one built into Simplify 3D for the original CR10. I started off with a full plate of my Patreon Maker Coins. I find these a good test print because they take a fair few hours and they're positioned all around the bed so I can test if they're consistent with their adhesion or if they release too easily. Well that definitely wasn't a problem here. They were extremely hard to get off, probably too hard. By the time I'd finished hacking everything, the aluminium bed had shifted a good 10 millimeters over to the side and needed realigning. The quality once again was definitely very good. I had zero complaints here. 
One thing I did notice, however, was a lot of built up filament dust. And that's because the filament mounts on top on this thing and then it has to have a very steep downward section and then a sharp bend into the extruder. Definitely not the optimum filament path and it seems like a little bit of an oversight. Next up, I needed a tolerance test and one of my students from school designed a great one. He's part of my F1 in schools team that's competing in the Australian finals in about two weeks. And he created a version of their race car that was broken up like a jigsaw and modular in nature. It uses dovetail joints to disassemble and then slot back together in new configurations to test back to back in the wind tunnel. The parts came off the printer looking very good. The only issue was where there was a very steep overhang for the nose. Everything fitted together well and served its purpose in the wind tunnel. It doesn't look like anything's happening, but here's a clip with the sound on. So that's a tick for surface quality and a tick for tolerancing. I went to verify this with a couple of more general PLA prints. Next up was this low poly Pikachu from Flowalistic. This is definitely a favorite of mine and I use it to benchmark between different printers like a 3D Benchy. Save for some very wispy stringing between the two top ears, it's a very, very nice print. The extrusion on this printer is very, very consistent. This was also around the time I was putting the direct drive kit on my Ender 3 and I was prototyping this modified Hero Me mount. This printer did a fabulous version of making it accurately and helping me develop the part. So far so good, so it was time to tackle something much bigger. This is a Klein vase was on the front page of my mini factory. It took about two and a half days to 3D print and I checked it every day and every night. There was one section on the bottom where it loops around on itself where the plastic didn't seem to adhere and fell through, but I'm putting that down to a slicing error. Apart from that, save for some minor stringing, it looks pretty fantastic and it was a good testament to the reliability of this printer on a much longer print like this. This is a really cool model and you'll find the link for it in the description as well as all the other models that I've printed in this video. Now when I first turned on the printer, the LCD was brilliant and it's blue but by the end of my setup procedure, it was starting to show some flickering and artifacts. By this stage, I had two columns of dead pixels and things going the wrong color. I contacted Banggood and they sent me out a replacement, but the printer sat idle for a few weeks. The good news is it's only four bolts and two plugs to replace it, but I did need to update the firmware and more on that later on. It's important to note that my printing from this point onwards was with the Simplify 3D profile provided by Tiny Machines on their website. And what was the first thing I tested to verify this profile? A 3D Benchy, of course. I think this profile could do with a little bit of tuning to get rid of some surface sits, but apart from that, this thing looks fabulous. No cooling issues, no surface artifacts, no zebra stripes, no anything bad. Just a really, really nice Benchy. It was time to test some different materials, and this thing should be capable of doing ABS, hitting the nozzle up to 260 with a maximum of 110 for the bed. I found this CNC clamping system on Thingiverse, but didn't quite go to plan. I went in to check on it partway through and a lot of it had come loose from the print bed. And when I looked even closer, I saw that the part cooling fan duct was hanging off sideways and broken. Now it only has one mounting bolt and you can see that it's deformed at that point. So I'm guessing it's printed from PLA and it simply got too hot, sagged down and collided with the printed part. Therefore, my next print had to be a replacement fan duct and I stuck with the ABS. This first one I picked off Thingiverse because it looked very close to the factory one, but I found that when I fitted it, it was too low and it rubbed on the tops of the parts. I also noticed that it seemed to point air up the wrong way. Duck 2 was definitely a modification and it was designed to slot over the top, therefore using three bolts instead of just two. This one worked well and I was happy with the way that it fixed the printer. It's linked in the description below and it might be worth printing out a spare. Satisfied that this printer could handle ABS, I moved on to printing flexibles with two types of TPU. The first is this red one from X3D. It has Shaw Hardness 95A, and it's definitely flexible, but it's not elastic. In terms of the profile, I slowed down the print speed to 40 millimeters per second. And apart from the stringing, this Pikachu turned out pretty good. It's definitely flexible, and with some tuning of the slicing profile, I think the results will be pretty good on this. The next thing I did to test was to try this very old Filiflex. Now this thing is not only flexible, but it's also elastic. I expected this to be a much tougher test for the printer, but to my surprise using the same G-code was able to print the Pikachu. Trouble was that the printed part was so flexible that it was moving and distorting and ruining the surface of the extrusion. And given this thing was hollow, I think this printer did about as good a job as you could expect. Onto PETG, and this print is something really special. 
This is a geode city, once again off Thingiverse, and I chose it for this PETG print because the PETG I have is white, but it's also a little bit translucent. Once again, there was a little bit of stringing, but all of the details of this micro city came out beautifully. How cool does it look when it's got a light coming from underneath? It's probably worth mentioning that this printing profile from Tiny Machines has a base speed of 90 millimeters per second. That makes the results even more impressive. So that's the printing over, but that's only half of the story. There was quite a few things going on with this printer that I'd like to cover now. And let's start with the LCD. Yes, a replacement was needed, but I haven't come across anyone else having this problem. So I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt that this was a freak one-off problem. However, it did lead to other issues. After I swapped over the LCD, it was missing buttons in the right place in some of the menus. I used the two files from Creality's website, but unfortunately it still didn't fix it. As a side note, compared to an Ender 3, updating the firmware on this is quite easy. It does come with a bootloader, so all you need to do is open up the files in Arduino, select your COM port, and then send it to the board. For the LCD, you've got to pull off the bottom cover to get to the internal SD card slot. Then you have to format a card in FAT32 with 4096 kilobyte allocation. Drop the files in the SD card and when you turn on the printer, you'll be presented with a special screen that lists the progress. After a couple of minutes, you can turn off the printer, remove that SD card and turn it back on again and everything will be updated. After a quick Google search, I discovered that page from Tiny Machines where I got the printing profile from and they had a much newer version of Marlin 1.1.9, as well as updated firmware for the LCD that had a lot more graphics built in. I flashed this and fortunately it fixed the LCD and all the functionality went back to normal. It's pretty disappointing that the files from Creality's own website didn't seem to be matched up and the printer couldn't really be used properly in that state. Next up, thermal runaway. And I tested this three times. I tested it with the firmware as shipped, I tested it after updating to the newest Creality firmware and I tested it after putting on the Tiny Machines version of Marlin. And guess what? Nothing worked until I put on the final version from Tiny Machines. On this printer, it's pretty easy to test. You simply bring it up to temperature and then the hot end heater can be unplugged from underneath the cover to the side of the X gantry. The nozzle temperature should plummet and well under a minute, you should have an error on your LCD screen where it's detected the problem and therefore shut down the heater. Despite the Creality version of Marlin having this uncommented in their firmware, it just doesn't seem to be in place properly. On the Tiny Machines firmware, however, it works exactly as it should have, and I strongly recommend that everyone goes out and flushes that firmware if you own this printer. Now the problems with auto bed leveling have been well documented in community groups for this printer. Some people have a perfect experience, but the majority find that it's really inconsistent and will height that it homes, and therefore it lays down that first layer. I was no different. I found that some parts went beautifully, other parts were way too high and didn't adhere, and more often than not, it got far too close and made a mess of the top of my bed. During this review, I tried following the Creality procedure with limited success. I also followed one in a video at the bottom of that Tiny Machines page and found it a little bit better. I lowered it right down, like people were saying on the forums, to the thickness of a credit card above the bed. But finally, I've settled on having it somewhere between one and two millimeters above the bed. Keep in mind that for a nice first layer, I had a positive offset set on the LCD of almost one millimeter. To avoid grinding from putting it this low, you might want to raise yours up preemptively and then slowly lower it down as you're doing your first layer. Until I can do some more testing, the only real solution is to be there when the print starts to live adjust the offset to make sure the first layer goes down nicely. Next, we have the filament runout detection. And one time I tried to test it and it just didn't work. Apart from the fact that the filament constantly jams on entry, I noticed that the blue light was on even when the filament was removed. I took out the four bolts and turned it upside down and saw that the switch was still on even when the filament wasn't pushing on it. I undid the further two bolts to take out the switch, used some pliers to bend it down slightly and then put it back together. This seemed to restore the switch to working order and I've gotten around the filament loading issues by twisting it 90 degrees. Keen to test that it did actually work, I test printed this vase. After giving the filament the snip, a few moments later, I noticed a message on the LCD screen detecting that the filament had run out. I pressed the button to initiate reheating, but then it told me that I needed to manually change it before I could resume. Trouble is, there's very little space between the filament runout sensor and the extruder. Since there's no filament to grab out the back, I found it necessary to get a set of pliers, squeeze the extruder lever, push it through to create enough room to then pull it out before I could load up the new filament. Pressing the button to resume the print worked as it should. 
although after moving back into position and had a really long pause before the printing actually resumed. You can see a gap on the final vase, but overall it's not too bad. Now power loss detection. I must confess that I didn't test this until right at the end of the review after I'd already changed the firmware to tiny machines. I'm not sure if that's the reason why, but I couldn't get this to work at all. Three separate times I pulled the plug, but as soon as I turned the printer back on, the LCD loaded up as usual and there was no option presented to resume the last print. Let's get on to the pros and cons, and by far the biggest selling point for this printer has to be the outstanding print quality. This thing has beautiful consistent extrusion, and the quality of the parts that come off it are up there with any of my other printers. You have to give it a big tick for the ease of assembly, and that really really nice detailed manual. The touchscreen, despite the fact that mine needed replacing, is still a real strong feature. The graphics on this are much more attractive than something like an MKS TFT like you'll see on other printers and the large size is very welcome too. Although I had issues with the Creality firmware, I have to acknowledge them for making it publicly available. This means that the community, like Tiny Machines, will be able to make modifications and keep things updated even if Creality don't. Big tick to the power supply for using a branded and certified Meanwhile version. It's probably once again worth mentioning the appearance. I still think this thing looks pretty slick. And I should also mention how quiet the stepper motor drivers are, because not only does it produce very smooth movement, but they're quite quiet as well. So what's all that noise then? Well, like I've said, several steps forward, one step back. The stepper motor drivers might be very quiet, but the fans on this thing are very, very loud. My kids even asked what the noise was coming from the next room at one stage. Now, as we've covered, that filament feed is less than ideal. And the major problem with this printer, of course, has to be the implementation of this auto bed leveling sensor. One of the thing that I think is a bit of an own goal in this is that it doesn't have any sort of user-friendly print surface. The whole way along, I had to really hack at the prints to get them off here. They almost stick too well. I'm disappointed that a premium printer of this price still needs one of these things and the risk of injury that comes with it. I think this printer is an ideal candidate to get something like the Wham Bam Magnetic Flexible Bed that I've previously fitted to my Ender 3. In summary, it's a difficult decision. The print quality is fantastic. So with that in mind, can you forgive the other shortcomings of this printer? Now we know this is probably gonna be popular on the reputation of the original CR10 alone. And that means a lot of community support and already we're seeing a lot of mods coming out to solve some of these problems. The question is then, are you willing to spend this much money on a printer that still needs a fair bit of tinkering? And that's something that each individual has to decide for themselves. Now I've previously reviewed the Artillery 3D Sidewinder X1 as a direct competitor to this. I have a review coming up in the future of at least one more competitor to this thing. So after I do that, you can expect a comparison shootout. In the meantime, I'm gonna do some modifications so you can expect some content on that. If you wanna see what I do, please hit that subscribe button. That's gonna wrap this one up. I have mixed feelings on this printer. It's got amazing print quality and so much potential, but those few niggling problems probably should have been caught by Creality in the early design stages. Please leave your thoughts and comments down below. And until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you wanna see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really wanna support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.